this session's theme is equality, diversity and inclusion, and I don't think we can ever stop thinking about this topic. It has to be part of our daily thinking, incorporated into our daily practice, and to be a natural part of any service planning, service delivery, any aspect of a recruitment or staffing, all of the aspects of our, our work should be incorporating equality, diversity, inclusion to make our services better. So it needs to be like drawing breath, the awareness, the, the recognition. And I think the sessions that we have this afternoon really help to, to allow us to make it part of daily practice as opposed to something that's compartmentalized or siloed or for what our particular committee to deal with. It needs to be incorporated on a, on a daily basis. So without further ado, let's hear all about how Ramona, return regular, regular attendee Ramona, but I, has worked with Cardiff University to incorporate critical appraisal for anti-racism as a, as a collaborative work to develop an e-learning module. You've read their biographies, you've read their abstract. Please, Lindsay, Ramona, Sarju, tell us all about it. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start screen sharing. <clears throat> okay, um, hopefully you can all see the screen. Um, my name is Lindsay Roberts. I am the college librarian at Cardiff University for Biomedical and Life Sciences. So I'm Sajid Patel, I'm the Associate Dean for EDI for the College of Biology and Life Sciences. I'm also a lecturer in the School of Medicine. And hi, um, I'm Ramona Naika. I'm a medical librarian at Monash University in Australia. Um, and I actually want to start by performing acknowledgement, which is a practice that we commonly observe here in Australia uh, before events. So I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm located, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also had Delith Morris, a librarian at Cardiff Uni, so she also worked on this with us, um, but couldn't make it today because she's on maternity leave. Um, but obviously she was really important to the project, and you can see her on the photo on the screen next to my big head. So we, we miss you, Delith. <laughs> Um, so going into the introduction, so today we're talking about an e-learning module that we all collaborated on for Cardiff University um, based, on, based on my work around critically appraising for anti-racism. So we're going to briefly give some background on that, explain the aim and rationale for the project, how it fits in with current teaching at Cardiff, the development process, the challenges that were faced, the impact that it made, um, and what we've got planned next as well. So um, we're trying to keep this kind of reasonably brief so you can ask lots of questions at the end as well. So over the last couple of years, um, I've been doing research into and work on how racial bias impacts study external and internal validity and how it should be recognized as part of the critical appraisal process. Um, so we don't really have time to go into all of that today, um, but as Isla said, I'm a bit of a UHMLG veteran and there are a couple of recordings of me, um, including on the UHMLG website, so do check that out if you're not familiar with it. Um, I also recently published a paper on the topic um, and from this work I created a supplementary critical appraisal tool for assessing racial bias in research, uh, which was also further refined at a UHMLG workshop actually. Um, so you can find the tool, my paper and links to all those videos on my website. So after presenting about it last year, Lindsay and Delith approached me uh, because they were interested in adopting the work into their library teaching. And then they'd gotten further support from Sarge um, to include it in Cardiff Uni's uh, medical education teaching. So I was obviously made up with that. Um, so the four of us went ahead with that project. So moving on to the project aim. Um, we wanted to create an e-learning module aimed at undergraduate first year medical students. And the module would allow students to see beyond the simplistic idea of what race is and build an understanding around how race, the social construct causes health inequalities and that genetic ancestry, not race, uh, might be the biological reasoning for prevalence of health conditions among certain populations. So I'm passing on to Sarge now. So one thing I think it's probably worth putting in context, um, particularly as I'm, I'm an ethnic person who, who was born here. So my parents emigrated in, in 68. I won't tell you when I was born, because I'll tell you how old I am, but I'm a bit, uh, I was after 68, let's put it that way. Um, and context really why, so because I was born here, I was also educated here, and that's really, really important of, of why this is this product work is quite important. 
So what it means to me as an ethnic individual is that I saw the world the way I was taught to see it. Um, I was taught in a Western world, so I was brought up in, in, in London and then in Cardiff. And our education system sees the world a certain way. And it imparts that on, on our students and imparts that um, and on anybody who's in that teaching environment of how to see the world. And it's usually through the world of, of you know, the Western eyes. For me, that meant that when I looked at health inequalities, um, and when I was taught about health inequalities, I looked at it as genetics. So I automatically referred it, I thought of it as a genetics. Um, and that's really down to the way things were taught to me and the way things were informed to me. Um, and how that impacted me was, uh, so as a medical uh, researcher in my previous life, this really impacted the way I looked at research. Um, I looked at research findings and how I interpreted these findings. And I generally based it on race and genetics predominantly. So when somebody says, uh, when research papers found there was a difference between ethnic groups when it comes to health outcomes or prevalence of diseases, the default position was, this is due to genetics. And if that's the case, well, there's nothing we can do about that because that's our genes. And therefore we can't change that and therefore it's a fact of life. Since moving on out of research, I've moved into teaching. So I, I teach medical students in years one and two, predominantly. Um, and that's probably impacted the way I teach them as well, because actually, if I thought it was to do with genetics, then we teach them, we teach that to the medical students and saying, actually it's genetics. Therefore, there's nothing we can do with, do about it. And therefore, when discussing differentials, you look at differentials based on race and you group everyone together and say, that's um, an Indian individual or this is an Indian race. These are Asians, these are Caucasians, and these are um, African-Americans or Africans. And therefore, certain diseases and certain health outcomes are based um, on the genetics. And therefore, you do differentials based on that. And so early on, um, well, up to probably um, me seeing this presentation by Ramona, that's the way I taught medical students. That's the way I taught them to see it. And that's the way I taught them to interpret it. And that's the way I taught them to do differentials. Um, and it's, I'd just like to thank Ramon, Lindsay and Dilly for showing Ramona's presentation because I would say that this is changing in our medical school, predominantly based on Ramona's work. Um, and we're putting together um, pieces of work um, to impact our students. Come on, next slide. <clears throat> so once, once obviously um, Ramona and I and Lindsay and Dilly had a conversation, we wanted to see how it fitted into um, our curriculum. So it's probably worth spending a little bit of time to understand how our curriculum is structured and um, to understand how we've started to fit this into our um, teaching. Probably in years one and two, uh, the main method of teaching is case-based learning. Um, and this is where students learn um, in, is learning is based on four life course scenarios spread over 17 cases. And each case lasts about two weeks and all adjunctive learning material is based on this scenario. This allows for contextualized learning. In addition to the case-based learning, students do student-selected components, and these are sp run specifically through uh, specific points in the year, and each year group will have um, specific areas or times they do this um, bigger component, um, SSC, it's called SSC, the student-selected component. So in years one and two, oh, years one, they do the literature review, um, the patho project, and a practical research experience. So the literature review is looking at research that's out there and summarizing it into a, a small 1500 word um, mini review. And the practical research experience is where they look at a research that's already been undertaken in our university um, and get a small snippet of, the, of, of what that research is and getting a small experience in the lab to, or a research environment to actually undertake a very small research. And that's an introduction to research. In year two, then they do a much more um, detailed um, experience, um, spend a week in a research lab or which is environment and present that findings. Um, and in year three and four, they do actually six and eight blocks in research environments. What we did there was then decided that actually a good place to implement this um, change or update was actually within the literature review, um, where this is the first foray into research and understanding research. And this is a good time for us to make them challenge the views that are written in the papers. So that's where we developed it. And our hope then is then they take this information that, that they've learned and add it to the CBL sessions. So when they do the CBL and learn about pathologies and cases and patients, they apply that learning they've learned in the literature review into the clinical environments as well. Um, next. 
You're handing over to me now then. Yeah. Great. So I'm going to talk you through kind of the development process we went through uh, to get to creating the tutorial. So uh, as Ramona said, we contacted her um, and thank you very much to the UHMLG committee who prov provided us with some financial assistance to enable Ramona to come down to Cardiff, um, stay in Cardiff overnight and work with us for two days. Um, during that two days, the four of us spent a lot of time in a room together. Um, <laughs> going through the work Ramona had done previously, talking about the tutorial, talking about our ideas, um, our kind of backgrounds, what we thought we could come up with. And we began the work of kind of storyboarding uh, the tutorial and our ideas. On the second day, we then ran a session with academic staff from the School of Medicine and also from the College of Biomedical and Life Sciences and explained our ideas, uh, Ramona's work and the ideas for the tutorial. Um, fortunately, nobody in the room said, this, this is a terrible idea, don't do it. Uh, everybody was very engaged and uh, interested. And um, in fact, we had people who were actively doing research in the room and we had some very interesting conversations about this was a kind of light bulb moment um, for them as well in terms of their work and the research they're doing um, and just as a kind of side note Sarge and I have been invited to go and speak to them as a group uh, in the summer to look at the research they're doing and how kind of this the, the work on anti-racism can really uh, help with their work. Um, once that uh, two days was over we then carried on working remotely to develop the tutorial so we met fairly regularly online um, to work through the tutorial, to talk about the details, to talk about the process, kind of how we felt going through the process. This was made slightly more challenging as Ramona moved to Australia. Um, <laughs> we had to start scheduling things rather than in the middle of the day, early in the morning, so we could catch Ramona as she was, before she went to bed in the evening, and that's when we just got up in the morning. Um, but that has continued to work really well. Um, as we kind of work through the storyboarding uh, within the university, we talk to um, lots of people to make sure that everybody was kind of comfortable with the work we were doing, the route we were taking. So we talked to the university librarian, we talked to the head of inclusive curriculum in the university, and we talked to the, uh, the EDNI lead for the university to make sure everybody was on board um, and comfortable. And they all gave incredibly positive feedback on the storyboard and the work we were doing. Um, Delith and I had meetings with um, academics in both psychiatry and pharmacology as we were, there were particular papers we wanted to use and we both felt we didn't have enough knowledge of medicine or science <laughs> to be able to um, really kind of understand as much as we wanted to. Those are really fascinating conversations and out of that both of them have gone away and changed um, some of their lectures and their presentations to reflect some of the topics that we have talked about and are in the tutorial. Uh, we then created the kind of draft dirty tutorial um, and worked through that, continued to work through that. And then that went live uh, last month with the first years for the first time. And a public version of the tutorial is going live next week, um, but we will share a link with you at the end. <clears throat> um, so just to kind of cover a bit on what the content of the tutorial actually is when you kind of go and look at it, we've tried to include as many activities as possible so it's really interactive, we didn't want the students to have a very passive experience of just reading the screens um, and not having to think and work through different topics. The um, tutorial starts with a kind of reflection um, as we've as I've included the quote here, uh, to really get students to reflect on the idea that race is a social construct. For some students, especially first year medical students, this will be the first time they've been confronted with uh, some of these ideas. And so we really want to start off um, in a very reflective place for them to really uh, consider um, their, their thinking currently. And then the tutorial is in three main areas. We look at the underrepresentation uh, in research, we look at health disparities, and then we look at how uh, in history biology has been used as a proxy for genetic ancestry. And then we explain uh, what an genetic ancestry means. 
Um, we also give, as we, well as giving the explanations, we include examples of a paper where, uh, for example, there is underrepresentation in research or they have used biology um, as a proxy. And then we include real world consequences so the students can understand how you go from a hypothesis to research to actually then that having uh, impact on um, patients or, or uh, people in the real world. Um, so then the kind of challenges, I guess, or reflection on the experience that we've had, or I guess particularly Delft and I had of the last uh, eight months, um, I think, and I hope Sarge and Ramona would agree that this has been a kind of fantastic experience of both cross-sectoral working from when uh, Ramona was in the NHS, now she's joined us in the world of the university, um, and working with an academic um, to such an extent of uh, really developing something together. Um, I think we felt, or certainly I felt, um, this was a very steep learning curve. I remember when Delft and I started, we were very enthusiastic, we were very enthusiastic and excited about doing this, and we still are. Um, but I don't think any of it, either of us had anticipated how much reading we were going to need to do, how much we would need to reflect, uh, the amount of conversations we would have to have with Sarge and Ramona, um, to really feel like we were comfortable and confident to kind of present um, this work. Uh, as I say, Dallas and I had moments where we were very uncomfortable, um, as you saw from Dallas' picture at the start, and from the colour of my skin, Dallas and I are both white, um, and we didn't always feel that necessarily we were the right people to be doing this work, um, but Ramona and Sarge, um, you know, brilliantly supported us when, you know, and encouraged us really in this work and encouraged us um, to continue and and the uncomfortableness is not a bad thing. That's, you know, that was alert when we're learning. But, um, you know, so we embraced that as we went through the process, I guess. Um, I think we also underestimated the amount of time it would take. Um, I said so in somewhere else, I don't think I've ever spent as much time um, writing something or <laughs> reflecting on something that I've written. Um, but we wanted to get this right. Um, so it was, you know, it was really important that we spent the time on it. And it has been a fantastic opportunity for us to talk to lots of different people across the university and really raise our kind of profile. Um, you know, I would not have had conversations with the head of inclusive curriculum um, in other circumstances. So um, that was really, you know, fantastic opportunity. Okay, back to you, Sarge. Thanks. So I was going to talk through this slide, um, but what I'm going to do is actually give you a moment to read through the piece of feedback that are there, um, and then I'll just um, add my two pence in worth after that. And while you're reading, I just want to point out a little mistake that we made on one of the slides. Um, we wrote that biology is used as a proxy for um, genetic ancestry, but it should have been race as being race. Used as a sorry, yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> So I think um, I think we feel the, the feedback speaks for itself, um, and it's been a really had a positive impact on our students. So this is just a snippet of some of the feedback that we've had. Um, and in terms of how they perceive race, but not also not only in terms of how they perceive race, but also how they interpret research findings. And I know this would this would definitely go on to improve them as doctors or future clinicians, and potentially if they do some research in the way they undertake research and, and analyze research. For me, the real gem was the last one. It's, it, it's really a real powerful bit of um, feedback that we've had from this, this particular individual um, because they're not only really reflected on, on their career and, and them as a doctor or future clinician, they've, they've looked at it as them as a patient as well and how he's impacted and how they've been treated as an ethnic person. And I know that's really going to improve them as a clinician down the line because if you can understand how a patient feels, then you as a future clinician, would, would be a better for it. I don't. I think there's nothing more else to say apart from you know we really enjoyed um, what we've done, um, and I think you know I've really enjoyed working with Ramona, Lindsay, and Dilith, and and the uncomfortableness um, is going to be there, but sometimes it's worth sometimes having to go through that uncomfortable period um, and come out the other end a better person for it. You're muted, Ramona. On yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so we've got lots of plans to take this further. Um, so as Linda mentioned, first of all, we've got a public version of the module. Um, 
which the, the, the link is there. So we can pop that in the chat as well. And um, so you can have a look at how, how it looks. Um, and so because this module as well was aimed at undergraduate first years as an introduction, um, we didn't go into anything like too complex. Um, and there are definitely facets of racial bias and research that we didn't cover at all in the module. Um, so we'd like to create, I guess, an advanced version, which, which carries on building on this version of the module. So it fits into this kind of spiral learning method that um, Sarge mentioned earlier. And of course, we've done a lot of work. Uh, we want to shout about it and we want others to do the same as well. Uh, so we're hoping to write something for publication too. So keep your eyes peeled on that. And I think that's all we've got. So we left plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much. That is, oh my goodness. To see the trend, the move from the sessions that we did in UHMOG from all the, I mean, Craigie, that didn't start from there, all the work that you've done off your own back, Ramona, into something that's a tangible, shareable resource, which takes it from teaching us as librarians into engaging with the students in a particular way. Absolutely amazing. So thank you very, very much. I'm going to ask Caroline to uh, raise any questions from the chat now. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation. Sorry if I got a bit background noise in this session. Um, so we've already shared some reading. That was one of the questions. Thank you for that. Uh, a question from Veronica. This project obviously relied on a lot of relationship building within the university. How easy was it to get people on board, especially the academics, many of whom you may mention completely changed their teaching content as a result of conversations with you? And clearly that would have involved a lot of time and effort um so i would say from my experience it was the people who we got involved it was very easy they were very easy the people i approached people i in terms of that i approached people i knew and i knew well i had a relationship with already and felt that they would be really um you know would be engaged uh in this kind of conversation and they were um and so that they they were it was not a challenge at all um i think you know the people who came to our original talk when Ramona came down um again they were really engaged and interested and I think we're also seeing that now in people kind of following up with us and saying can you come and talk to us at this session uh, about the work that you're doing um so I think we already had some good relationships and this enabled us to kind of just build on some of the relationships we already had Delphi and I had a good relationship with with Sarge uh, already um so this enables us to build on that and I think that the same was true with kind of other people we approached when we nobody really approached you know from the university librarian to the head of inclusive curriculum to the other academics everybody was really interested just really interested uh in the work and what we were talking about and, and you know really engaged in hearing about it so um in that respect this that was very easy <laughs> a lot of work but very easy I just want to add to that. So I think I think it is that fact that uh, Lindsay and Della have a very good your reputation within the medical school, um, and that we tend to listen to what she they have to say, particularly. And um, both of them sent me the Ramona's um, presentation, and I think I think there was a pause, wasn't there? Because I was so busy that I didn't look at it, and then you nudged me a little bit and said, "Have a look at this," um, and I said, "I look at it," and I looked at it, and within an hour, I phoned you back and said, "I need to speak to Ramona now." Um, um, was literally that that's the way it went um, and that's that's how I just took off from that point thank you very much so the next question is from Lindsay I guess I'm wondering whether genetic ancestry has any impact on health is it a valid category of research ever um Yes, certainly. Genetic ancestry. I'm not. I'm no geneticist, but I'm very sure that genetic ancestry does have an impact on health. Um, the kind of thing that we're raising is that often race is used as a proxy for genetic ancestry. So in research, they'll say that health differences, if they're genetic, they're due to race. Um, and the problem that this does is it suggests that races are different biologically and that some are biologically superior and some may be biologically inferior. So this is why race well race is not a good proxy for genetic ancestry anyway because it's a social construct it's not biological and um, so it's just it's really just moving away from that so while yes there is definitely a basis um in health for genetic because of genetic ancestry um it shouldn't be confused or used as a proxy or vice versa for race 
I just thought that question. genetically, so as a researcher, I know that genetics has an impact on our outcomes, health outcomes sometimes. So certain groups are more predominant, certain diseases are more prevalent in certain groups. And there's a genetic reason for that. But it's also confounded by other factors that are modifiable. And it's understanding the difference between the genetics, which is not modifiable, versus the health outcomes with, with social, economic, um, and just cultural differences that can be looked at and adjusted uh, and, and addressed um, quite simply or quite sometimes quite easily. Um, in terms of the other requests about extra reading, at the end of the tutorial, there is a, all of the kind of um, books and papers and, and also Ramona's work that we looked at. So if anybody does want to see any other reading, because I did lots of reading, because I, I did lots of reading. Um, so that's at the end of the tutorial as well, if anybody is interested in you know having a look at, at the other books that we read. Just to interject, the, the fluency that Ramona has in terms of speaking about these topics, Sergio as well, it's just the mm. fluency of, the, of, of coming up with those answers adds adds to the, just the, the authenticity and the, and the, it's so much more convincing. I think I would stumble over my words and it's just that confidence with the topics and the, and the, 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 your, the fluency is, is always so impressive to me. And, and I think that's where kind of Delith and I started from, Isla, that's exactly how okay. we felt at the beginning. Delith and I were like, we're never going to feel like we would be confident to lead a session on like this topic no like we're nowhere near but but our experiences of working on the tutorial working through the tutorial and the reading have really helped gained us gained that confidence and still now you know Della before she went in kind of the early autumn she did a presentation to a group of students on the work that we were doing as we were working on it and you know she was able to do it beforehand she hadn't felt confident but she knew that she was able to you know I don't have the answers to everything. None of us have the answers to all of this. This is all kind of still being worked through and looked at, but, you know, she was in a much more confident place to, um, you know, be able to have those conversations and discussions. And also as a librarian to be able to say, I, you know, I don't know all the genetics bits. That's what you need to go and talk to your academic about. <laughs> I don't know about all the genetic testing you could possibly do on this. Ask the questions. But Ask I can questions. start you yeah. thinking about the questions. You can go and, uh, and have that conversation with your tutor. I think just, just to add to what Lindsay got to say, I think one of the things that we talked about at the very outset was making sure the environment that we create for ourselves when we're doing this is inclusive and that actually mistakes aren't going to be pounded or pounced upon um, because it's not the environment we wanted. It's not going to help developing this, um, this teaching material if we keep pointing fingers at people. So we understood that both of us, to some extent, and particularly um, Lindsay and Dilith were on a learning curve with respect to this, um, and that we were, hopefully, Lindsay, um, we were very uh, supportive in that. Mm, yes, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go one to, back to one a bit earlier mm. from Jonathan. Um, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the importance of, of language and the terminology we use. So Jonathan asks, can you explain your choice of minoritized ethnic populations as a definitional term? Yeah, so this is kind of, um, I guess, something that I kind of went with at the beginning. Well, actually, at the very beginning, I was using the term BAME still, and then I um, I decided to move away from that. And so, so this is the, this is kind of the important bit about it is that, you know, language evolves all the time. Um, think we realize that certain words or certain terminology maybe aren't as appropriate as we thought they were in the past. Um, and now we use minoritized ethnic, but that doesn't mean that in the future, maybe that would be appropriate anymore either. It just seemed right at the time. Um, and the reason for minoritized ethnic rather than ethnic minority is that ethnic minority places minorities just as a statistic rather than seeing that they've been actively minoritized by the non-minoritized populations. Yeah. Any other comments on that? Thank you, Ramona. Um, sorry, did you ask for any other comments? My, I think my sound just went out. I was just wondering if anyone else had any other 
No, we kind of we, uh, we put a bit at the bit start of the tutorial, which basically says, you know, terminology changes and, you know, but this is the terminology we have chosen. So we accept that this would not be a term terminology that everybody would use. And we know there are other terms that be, other people would use. But this was the one Ramona has been using and is kind of the one we stuck with for this tutorial. And as Ramona said, you know, we may change it in the future, you know, as terminology changes i think just you know just reiterating what you said you know these terminology changes as time goes on and evolves um and you know i, I recall having a meeting with some of our my um ethnic colleagues and we're discussing whether we use bame or not bame and it was it, there isn't a a line in the sand you know it, it's so different there are different views on this um within within even the ethnic groups that there's no set um, terminology that accepted universally. Yeah, and in an ideal world, we wouldn't group people together at all. We'd be able to individually name all the different groups that make up, you know, um, minoritized ethnic. But of course, that um, you know that that has challenges on its own. So um, until we think of something better, we do have to group people together. Unfortunately. Thank you. Any other questions, Carolyn? Yeah. So we've got one from Jess. Um, talking about filtering down into the literature and database cataloging. Um, uh, they say, I don't teach medical students, just nursing and allied health. And this way of stating race as a social construct within these subjects isn't really present from what I'm seeing. Uh, and then she says, thank you for this. Give me a lot to think about. Definitely will be sending the critically a, a critical appraisal tool around my colleagues. So that um, sense about the filtering down to the literature and the database cataloging, what, what, what would you? Yeah, I, I, I would, I would agree that it isn't there yet, and this is, I mean, partly something for us to look at. And we've been talking, you know, in a in an advanced one. Obviously, they, we've looked very much in terms of uh, papers. This was obviously very much about critically appraising, and so what, what's in a paper? But I think the next stage can be, um, you know, actually what gets into it into the databases that exist and how they categorize and group things obviously we know there's been some uh discussions about obviously mesh subject headings um uh and this was partly what we wanted to kind of raise with the students who will be researchers of the future that's where we're also having conversations with people who actually do population uh research at the moment um who also have always grouped people <laughs> in these groups and had never even thought about why they grouped people as we do. Um, so we're trying to kind of do our bit, I guess, to kind of be raising this in areas of people who are doing research, who will do research of the future, who are searching things to be thinking about actually not just how are things people grouped in a paper, but then how is that reflected in catalogues and in subject headings and in filtering um yeah there's a lot of work to do and i will say once you see this like you can't unsee it you will see it all the time everywhere <laughs> i think once down for like we we looked at things we read papers and we looked at websites for this and stuff we would just have taken as read you know we suddenly looked in a different way a, a sentence that we would have just accepted completely before we did this work you you viewed it completely differently after having done this work um so it, it really is eye-opening and yeah i think just after that, so it's having a bit of impact with our research as well because um we're discussing i've had discussions regarding recruitment as well because obviously within within research in the uk particularly predominantly um there's a lack of ethnic people within research participants um that are of ethnic origin um and part of the discussion we're having is is how are you recruiting? So where are you going to recruit? And if you're recruiting, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So if you want ethnic people that to, to uh, participate in this, there are different things they're looking for, things that you may feel um, certain groups may, may attract them, may um, worry other groups, uh, and they may move away just because of it. You know, there's certain terms and how we interpret words is different because our life experiences are different, and therefore we see things differently slightly. Um, and then obviously going out to the communities, you know, just putting something out there as an advert is not enough. You need to go to these communities and talk to them because you know, there's an issue of trust as well. Um, and then you, you've got to build trust in these communities. You can't expect them to just turn up. 
I know in the list of reading that you've got on your website, Ramona, there's a, a paper by NHR about techniques and strategies of incorporating more a wider mm -hmm. diversity of participants in 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 work. And it it's not enough yeah. just to say, oh, it's hard. We tried, but we didn't get anywhere. It's that's not enough. Oh, no, Car well, it's Caroline, do you want to mute? Oh, there we go. <laughs> So it's a completely like multifaceted problem, you know. No, not one single little intervention is gonna is gonna solve is gonna solve this. Um, but yeah, just to to mention that um, the NIH, NIHR paper, it's the Include framework, um, and it aims to kind of increase visibility for all underserved groups. So not just minoritized ethnics, but um, like genders and um, people with disabilities and so on as well. So yeah, do check that out if you're interested in the work. Yeah, uh, I'm just picking up the questions while well, Caroline's getting a better signal. Ian's asking a question that I think a sort of I almost sort of touched on at the, at the very start about incorporating work into everyday practice and whether he, Ian's asking if, if it's better to have anti-racism critical plays as a separate tutorial so that people that are interested clearly but people that are not interested can ignore it or whether it's better to be incorporated into into usual practice yeah I, I being a little controversial in my presentation of Ian's much better phrased question. <laughs> no, no, and I totally, we, this was part of the conversation we had at the very beginning when we decided we were going to do this uh, and we knew the kind of time frames we sort of had to work with. We we discussed whether we wanted to do, uh, as, you know, build it into something or, or have it be separate. And I know Ramona's talked about this when she came last year is her experiences of doing it separately. Um, we, we did it like this because how we operated it with the students is they have a critical, in the run up to their literature they have a critical appraisal session uh, with an academic um, and we were able to incorporate it. So they completed this tutorial as well as then they brought that their kind of learning from the, that, the tutorial into the critical appraisal session they had with the academic. So we picked three papers specifically, they were COVID related. We rechecked them all to make sure that they would uh, all bring something that they could have learned from this tutorial. They could have that conversation about how had the papers grouped people? Did they feel that was representative so that they could use their knowledge that they'd gained from the tutorial in the actual conversations we had about critical appraisal. So we brought the two things together but we enabled them to have a tutorial which just focused on the anti-racism side because we felt like there's a lot in there for people to get their heads round um, in terms of race as a social construct, health disparities, and we wanted to make sure they had, you know, the time to kind of really focus and think about that and then bring that into the kind of critical appraisal uh, session. Uh, yeah. Think, oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to just say, um, Lindsay had mentioned that um, I was kind of having the same dilemma, I guess. Um, and when I was in the NHS and I was offering it as a standalone uh, critically appraisal for anti-racism session, um, of course, it's not compulsory for NHS staff to attend any sessions, <laughs> any sessions like this. But um, the uptake was just people from like the BAME staff network and you know people that had this kind of like general interest already anyway. Um, so it was hard to offer as a standalone session for me at the time working in the NHS. So what I then did is I just kind of like incorporated it into my normal um, critical appraisal sessions. Um, so I guess if, if you know, in a university setting and versus an NHS setting, you kind of have to consider, you know, all these differences and how it might best apply to kind of your um, your institution and your environment. Absolutely. But Sometimes you, you'll you need that that he massive headline, start thinking about it to then incorporate it into everyday practice. You, you sometimes need to, 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 to be shown it, as Lindsay said, to start seeing it everywhere and to, to get that understanding. And I think for our students also uh, to add to that, obviously that that flip class on top of you know you do the, you you do the tutorial, and, and like we said, we we put lots of pauses in there for them to reflect. It's not just about just learn this stuff and memorize it. It's think about it, um, reflect on your experiences versus someone else's experiences, and then we bring them back in the classroom with academics, um, which is probably where um, where I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. But that's where they can ask the questions. That's where they can have the discussions. That's the way they can teach each other as well and, and come from different concepts or different perceptions. Yeah. I think that the, I mean, not lucky, obviously I'm, I, I was the academic who ran the sessions within our school. The question becomes, you need to make sure the academic who's delivering this is competent to deliver it or has or understands the concepts. 
but then the session is written. <laughs> the session that Sarge gave and the other academics was written by Della. <laughs> All about collaboration, collaboration, isn't it? It's all about, all about collaboration. What's the has have you done any evaluation yet with the students? Have you have you gauged their reaction? Clearly, there's a massive impact with the academics, and that's that's a hugely important part of the the process. Has there what's the reaction been with from the students? The the feedback on the slide was that from the students. We're also just they've just submitted that today is the submission date for their literature review to be completed, and they have to submit as part of that. They also submit a research trail, which the library staff mark. So I'm one of the people marking them. Um, and we are picking up in that, that you can see that they are, um, they have been thinking about this and they are talking more about the population that they use. Did they feel the population was representative uh, of that population? They, some of them have talked about, uh, you know, the numbers that have been used and whether this population matches the American population, for example. So we can see some of them are really taking this, these thoughts on board and are reflecting that back in their kind of uh, writing and assessment. So we can already see um, some impacts, which is what we were hoping to see. That's going to take time. So it's one of the things we've got to make sure that we build, you know, sessions later on in the years um, ahead, because you can't change this sort of thought process overnight. It takes time. Um, and that's why we want to build the other sessions later on in, in the subsequent years, for them yeah. to start to revisit this and discuss it more and more. Which, I mean, very much, very much looking forward to, to seeing the progression of this work and the, the fact that it's public right now. There's a lot of love going on in the chat for the fact that it's been shared as a public resource. I mean, that's that's absolutely fantastic and, and generous and um, and again, we're, we're looking forward to seeing how, how this develops. There's a couple of comments, uh, one from Karen, as, as a black librarian of maybe the same vintage as you, Sarge, is the, is the is quoting from Karen. I, I, she's found the, your, your comments about relearning from our conditioning very resonating. So I think that's a, just as that, that final uh, student feedback was, mm. was mm. hugely resonating. I think that, that, that speaks volumes as well. So thank you. Thank you, Karen, for, for sharing. Um, there's comments about the the quality of subject headings is, is bounding around this the the challenging terminology that is popping up every now and again in the in the subject heading situation. But I'm wondering if this is expanding into the decolonizing and the expansion of this literature searching into the global south sources of information, so that the information from the south is incorporated into research about the south. Is, is, it, is it expanding and having ripple effects across the rest of the, the information literacy work that's, that goes on? Well, I think certainly, and actually to everybody that notices any kind of like injustices or any, you know, looking at mesh heads and saying that these are not appropriate, like shout about it. Like that is all I did. Um, and actually, oh, I'm going to pop in the chat a link to, this is a presentation um, that's going to be given at the Australian Library Association, um, a conference that they're holding. Um, and this is a session by Gemma Simensa, who, um, who lives here in Australia. And she basically started, um, you know, she raised the issue around how Aboriginal Australian, that terminology was used in um, in the mesh headings and kind of initiated change about it. You know, if, you, if you're if you loud about it, you can't initiate change. So, so that is what I encourage people to do. And I see it, you know, there's a whole kind of like critical library movement at the moment. Um, so talking about how yeah, how data is gathered, how data is used, the mesh headings, this this um, appraisal that we're doing. Um, so yes, yeah, so it certainly I'd say there's a there's a ripple effect and, and the move the movement is growing, which is good to see. Fantastic. On is the it, ground, Lindsay, is it is it changing on the ground in terms of incorporating other sources in terms of literature searching? Um, I think that's the next thing to be looked at and what I mean I, well the other thing in terms of like obviously we've been this this tutorial is very focused obviously on medicine but we're having conversations within the university library service about actually how could you use this rewrite a tutorial that you could use for other schools within the university so it's not just about you know medicine obviously there can be it can be applicable to all schools but and also to think about it we've given kind of one lens uh, race is one way of looking at a uh, critical appraisal, but you could actually do the same for uh, many other or mm -hmm. all of the protected characteristics. 
uh and you know i think longer term we'd kind of like to see some tutorials created on you know critically appraising using some of the other protected characteristic lenses and also thinking about things like you know who is who gets to do research uh and how research gets published and uh you know who gets to um you know have their things published in the um in, in a database what does get picked up um so yeah i think th this is the start and we've got lots of ideas as kind of how, how much broader uh, you could take it and how much more you can cover but yeah, yeah absolutely i can think I, you know off the top of my, we sat down when we sat down and talked we thought about talked about almost every other subject that the university covers and thought about how you could apply this in history and geography and yeah. social sciences and you know e e everywhere really yeah. Watch this space. Cardiff is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one, coming one thing, to get us. One thing Lindsay did touch on that I think is really important is that at the end of the Zerti, we ask the students to think about other groups, not just race, that are disadvantaged because of or, or um, um because of their um not necessarily political characteristics, but because of the characteristics. Um and you know, with disability being one of them. So we we've actually opened the door to other aspects and want the students to then um oh, explore those aspects as well yeah yeah the thinking about all it from a, a little privileged situation that you live in it, it, it just starts to make your head explode how limited the range of literature is isn't it mm. how that's it's fascinating stuff carolyn have you picked up on any other questions that I seem to have missed um, so far. Thank you for picking those up, uh, Isla. Um, I just wanted to check about one from Fiona. Are you happy for the link to the module to be shared on Twitter? Was that one picked up? Yeah, just the only thing we're waiting for, because we are in Wales, because we are Welsh, uh, we need to have the Welsh translation done. The Welsh translation should be done by Monday. <laughs> so just I mean, we, we're obviously telling you, but that's why we're not, if you cannot maybe not put it on Twitter at this point, just because we don't, well, obviously we don't have it in Welsh and that would, is not good <laughs> at the moment for Absolutely our Absolutely fair Welsh enough. Language. So, um, but we will tell people when it is uh, properly available. Uh, so it's there for you to look at now, but we're not kind of promoting it more widely because we want to make sure we've got the Welsh uh, language version as well. Well, please you, all of you feel free to skip over the video that is included of me ramona and sarge like we never please, need to look, please. <laughs> i'm going to be putting that on slow <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy it in a fool <laughs> thanks for the tip lindsay much appreciated <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of comments coming uh, through now. One um, from Karen, so that Ca Cardiff University have got funding for a cataloguing project post looking to legacy issues within subject headings in the library catalogue. That's wonderful, isn't it? I'd be yeah, really interested to know to where you we're got just, that from. We're just recruiting to the post uh, now. The uh, We're recruiting a member of new member of staff. Um, who uh, So that's being recruited at the moment. Did you get funding from the university for that? Mm Lindsay or from a, a charitable or well. No, Karen, I'm really hoping you can remember where the funding <laughs> come from and she put it in, she's gonna I'm hoping she's gonna put it in the chat. Yes, there we go. So it's from the HefQ Race Equality. We also got money to run uh, oh. some advanced eight advanced H E anti racism courses for the library staff. Um so we're going to be doing those in the summer so fantastic yes as you've said isla we're all in on adian <laughs> so i'm looking forward to future future uhmlg event agendas being filled up with with cardiff content i'm looking to see that all the all the good work are there any other questions that anybody's got burning do you stick them in the chat there's the expansion of of uh, literature searching, Keith says, including Global Index Medicus, which is which is brilliant. Yeah, to to expand out the, the sources of information, as well as the, obviously they still need to read them and critically appraise. And Lancaster, you've got a decolonizing a uh, literature search guide. I shall be definitely be sure looking at that a little bit later. I know that good work was is being done by by you, John, and the the team at, at Lancaster. 
Um, there'll, there'll also be a Health Education England module um, that will be released hopefully very soon. Um, so Health Education England have got a critical appraisal series of modules. Um, so the first one was released just before Christmas, I think. Um, and then the second one is about health inequalities. And um, so I'm the lead author on that one as well. So that's not just race, that's kind of all health inequalities, but it is super, super beginner. Um, but you know, it's, it's a nice place to start as well for, for people who haven't been exposed to this. I think it's all about that somewhere to start, isn't it? The the confidence, the, the familiarity, the range of terminology, just getting confident with it all. It, it does require a bit of work. It's not just a case of, excellent, just give me a PowerPoint and I'll be able to do the same as you. I absolutely wouldn't. It does take a little bit of engagement, doesn't it? And, and you need to spend some time. But then the rewards are enormous and the consequences are significant. As it, So... Just with an eye on the time, if there's no other questions apart from Karen, throwing in the links right, left and centre, thank you very much for those, much appreciated, so that's always very, very good. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for doing the work, for sharing the work and making the work available to the rest of us as well, so very much appreciate your time this afternoon, it's lovely, you get to go to bed now Ramona, but do stay yes. if you would like. <laughs> But I'm definitely, huge, going definitely going to bed. Huge appreciation, as I say. There's been a lot of admiration and thanks and wows going on through the, the chat as well. So very much appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank oh, you. thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing all the other presenters. I'm um, because they're all being recorded, right? I'll I'll be able to catch up on those. Absolutely. Probably. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much and um good night. Yeah, good night. Good night, Ramona. Thank you very much to, to Cardiff and the rest of your Eurovision style um, presentation is going to end at that point. But many, many thanks. We're gonna pause for a few minutes now.